All right, so this is the, uh, the example video for the solutions to the Algebra 2 Quest 1. Moving along here. First, uh, first thing to do is to show which of these expressions, which of these four, perhaps more than just one, is equal to negative 8. So uh, what I see as I think about the order of operations is that the parentheses has to happen first. Okay, but then right after that, I'm going to do exponents, right? And these are not really, like, if I do these at the same time, they're not going to affect each other. And then I'm going to work to multiplication and division. And again, this is not going to affect what happens in the parentheses. Doing negative 10 divided by 5 is not going to affect what I have to do with the exponents. So I do them all three at once. You can hear my son screaming upstairs, uh, but he's fine. 3 squared is 9 minus 15 minus whatever comes out of the parentheses, except negative 6 plus 6 is 0, so don't have to worry about that. But negative 10 divided by 5 is negative 2. 9 minus 15 is negative 6 minus 2 is negative 8. That's good, because we're looking for negative 8. First one down. 2 squared is 4 minus 6 minus what we see in the parentheses. 9 minus 7 is 2. Negative 28 divided by 7 is a negative 4. And then we just keep going. I'm going to say like 4 minus 4 is 0. Negative 6 minus 2 is negative 8. So that one works too. 2 cubed, that's 8. Subtract 5. Minus what we get in the parentheses, 9 plus 2 is 11. Negative 1 divided by 1 is well, negative 1. Uh, 8 minus 5 is 3, 3. Negative 11 minus 1 is negative 12. Okay, um, it's not looking good. This is negative 9. So this, no worky. 2 squared is 4, minus 15, minus what we find in the parentheses, which is negative 5. Negative 12 divided by 6, negative 12 divided by 6 is negative 2. Uh, 4 minus 15 is negative 11, minus a negative 5, that's plus 5, minus 2. Negative 11 plus 5 is going to be negative 6, minus 2 is negative 8. So that one also worked. Solve the equation, okay? So we have some pretty good equation solving skills. So we're going to subtract 10 from both sides, which gives us negative 16 over here. I like to put the variables on the left side. Divide by 16 and C is negative 1. All right, uh, now I have variables on both sides. Of course, that's what we're trying to find out. Do you know how to handle that issue? I'm going to subtract 7A from both sides. That's going to give me 2A on the left side. I still have plus 7, still have a negative 15. I'm going to subtract a 7 from both sides. That's a negative uh, 22. Um, after that, divide by 2. A is negative 11. Um, OK, we have two variables on the same side. So what do we do there? Uh, well, they're on the same side together, so let's just kind of sweep them together into a pile and figure out how many there are, right? 12C minus 8C is going to give us 4C minus 20. Um, I'm going to add 20 to both sides, and 4C is going to be equal to positive 12 divided by 4, and C is 3. Yeah, it was a look at this one. We've got some distribution that's going to happen. We've got some variables on both sides. But uh, we don't know exactly what it's going to look like. Let's just start. Right, I'm going to move this over here a bit, and then I'll have room over here to work. Um, so negative 11y um, minus 7 is equal to, hold on. All right, I just made the pen a little bit thinner. Um, all right, so negative 11 minus 7 equals distribute 4 times negative 7y 
is negative 28y. 4 times 10 is 40. Um, plus 21. On the left, we have negative 11y, because what I'm doing at this point is just collecting these like terms. Plus uh, 61. Okay, I have variables on both sides, and when I cancel out on one side, I would like the result to be that I have positive variables. So I add 28y to both sides. Uh, so 28y minus 11y is 17y minus 7 equals 61. I'm going to add 7 to both sides, and 17y is going to be equal to 68. Um, yeah, if I divide both sides by 17, I'm going to get y is 4. Right. I'm going to solve these literal equations. Okay, that means that our, our solution is not going to be so easy as letter equals number, but letter equals all the stuff that that letter isn't, right? All the other stuff. So we're going to solve for w, which means let's first cancel out this plus a, which means we're going to subtract a from both sides. For w is equal to whatever 9r minus a is. Divide by 4, and w is equal to 9r minus a, all divided by I'm going to solve the following inequality. No, 6, then 7. Okay, so we're going to solve the following equation. All right, so this one's a little bit better than number 5. All right, we're just going to distribute here. And you know what? I'm at the same time that I distribute, I'm going to subtract 10 from both sides. Okay, I'm going to get 4x plus 20 equals negative 4. I'm going to subtract 20 from both sides, so 4x is going to equal negative 24. Divide by 4 on both sides, and x is equal to negative 6. Okay, we'll move down to number 8. Okay, solve the following inequality and graph the solution. All right, so we have to keep things in mind. I uh, said do the same thing on both sides. If we divide by a negative, we flip the sign around, and then we have to remember how to graph an inequality. Not too bad. So subtract 8 from both sides. Negative 3d is going to be greater than uh, 11 minus 8 is 3. OK, so we're going to divide by negative 3. And whenever the thing that you're dividing by is negative, you're going to flip that sign around. So d is going to be less than, not greater than, less than negative 1 because 3 divided by negative 3 is negative 1. How do we graph that? Let's throw a uh, 0 right in the middle. Negative 1 would just be right there. Negative 1. Uh, D has to be less than negative 1. So clearly, like, negative 6 or something, those are fine. Negative uh, 4 is good, and all these negative numbers are good. And then I get tired of drawing dots, and that's why we start shading in all this stuff. All that shading, it's just really a bunch of dots. Okay, so what to do at negative 1? We're going to put an empty circle because what that tells us is that d can be anything from here and to infinity. The other is a negative infinity, really. So any of those numbers is going to work like negative 945. Negative 945 is less than negative 1. Okay, But if I get right to negative 1, is negative 1 less than negative 1? No, it isn't. It is the same. And the symbol does not tell me that equals 2 is also OK. So the open circle tells us, get as close to negative 1 as you want, but then stop. Right? Do not allow d to be anything from negative 1 up towards positive, positive infinity. So that's how we graph it, shading everything to the left of negative 1 and an open circle at negative 1. If you missed any part of that, if, if you still have questions about it, I highly recommend that you jump back and listen to that explanation at the end, because it's all there, everything you need there, except for maybe why we flip the sign around. 
Uh, that explanation is not there, but I'd be glad to explain it to anyone in person if they desire. Uh, next, uh, we have this inequality to solve, and um, I am going to solve it without distributing. I'm going to show you what that looks like. So I'm going to add 4 to both sides. Same thing to both sides. 3 times d minus 5 equal, not equals, is less than or equal to negative 3. So here's I'm going to not distribute. Instead of distributing and then dividing, see on this one, I distributed the 2 and then I had to divide and I could have saved myself that if I had just divided first. Divide by 3, divide by 3. Moving on up here. d minus 5 is less than or equal to negative 1. Add 5 to both sides. I've not divided by a negative. So that sign's going to be less than or equal to, just like it was to start with. So d is less than or equal to uh, positive 4. Positive 4, because I added 5 to both sides. So d is less than or equal to 4. How do we show that? Uh, 4 is not that big. We could throw 0 right in the middle. Move up to the right 4. Put our 4 down. Okay, d needs to be less than 4. So we can shade all that stuff all the way up to 4. And then we ask ourselves, what about 4 itself? And now my uh, program is winging out. I think what I'm going to have to do is close this down and start it back up. But that will seem like no time to you. Well, maybe not no time if this doesn't... All right, so you'll notice all my work has disappeared, so I will quickly recreate it, but all this stuff will still be gone. So as I was saying a moment ago, d has to be less than 4, right? So that's to the left of 4, but what about right at 4? Let's just plug it in and see. Is this true? Is this okay? That is true, because this is 4 is less than or equal to 4, which it is. That's why at 4, instead of an open circle like before in the previous problem, we have a filled-in circle and shading right up to it, which says that d can be anything to the left of 4 and exactly 4. Both of those are fine. Okay. Um, compound inequality, although now I'm seeing my typo. It's not a compound inequality. Uh, so all that takes is that we solve both of those inequalities, and then we graph true to this this qualifier here, or, and we'll figure that out in a second. So we'll subtract 8 from both sides on this one. 3x is less than or equal to <clears throat> uh, 32. Um, hmm, interesting. So I divide by 3 on both sides, and x is less than or equal to 32 divided by 3 which does not work out well, but that is about uh, 10 and 2 thirds, or some might say it's exactly 10 and 2 thirds. Um, let's solve this guy here. In fact, actually, let's, let's graph this one here first. Um, so x is less than or equal to 10 and 2 thirds, so we might have to work on a scale here. Maybe each of these is worth 2. two 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, here's 11, 10 and 2 thirds would be right there. Sorry, I had to take a short break there. Um, so uh, yeah, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, that's 12, there's 11, right there is 10 and 2 thirds ish, 10 and 2 thirds. Okay, what's going on there? It needs to be less than that. So uh, I believe Jeremy pointed out that we can just kind of put a little note for ourselves that from there over, right? And we'll uh, we'll have a filled in circle there. Um, those are the values that we want to shade in, but we also want to consider this guy with its or. Right? So let's fall. Let's uh, uh, solve this. Negative 6x is less than, we subtracted 5 from both sides and got 24. Okay. Uh, and then divide by negative 6, and x is less than negative 4. Oh, except for it's not, because, let's just back it up. Mm, or not. 
Okay, so I'm just trying to do the undo there, but uh, this computer's going to make me lose my mind this morning. So x is greater than, because we're divided by a negative number, so we need to flip around that inequality sign. So it's x is greater than negative 4. Where's negative 4 on the scale? Each of these is 2, so this is negative 2, negative 4, negative 4, right there. It's greater than negative 4, okay? So for this, for, for uh, graphing this one, we would shade to the left of two, 10 and 2 thirds. For this one, we would shade to the right of negative 4. All right. So this says or, or. All that means is that any point that we choose along the number line needs to solve one or the other or both of these inequalities. So let's choose something like negative 8. Negative 8. Negative 8 is going to land in the shading of this inequality, right? So if we were to plug that in here, negative 8. Negative 8 certainly is less than a positive number, right? So that one works in that inequality. Uh, let's choose 0. 0 works here. 0 is less than 32 over 3. 0 is also greater than negative 4, so it actually works for both. Let's pick one way out here, like a 20. 20. 20 is not less than 32 thirds, but it is greater than negative 4. So if it works for one or the other, one or the other, or even both in the case of 0, that's okay. And you look, if we shade to the left doo -doo 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 -doo, of 10 and 2 thirds, and we shade to the right of negative 4, what do we have? The whole thing is shaded in. Okay. And uh, these little arrows here, not really important. They're helping us just kind of see the landscape. Uh, and really with or, with or compound inequalities, you can shade both things. You just shade them. And nothing's really going to happen. Like, these are the valid values of x uh, inside of either of these shadings. And if the shadings overlap, that's fine. If the shadings don't overlap, that's fine. If they overlap in such a way that everything gets shaded, then that's fine too. Because as long as everything inside the shaded areas satisfies either this equation or this equation, we're good to go. So that was the last on that page. Okay, we need to show the area of this uh, of this rectangle. So this is a rectangle that is two inches by eight inches. Let me try and draw eight equal sections. And again, the drawing is not to scale. So. Even though these, they, they, these do not look like squares, they are supposed to be squares. Uh, and there are, how many? 16 of them. And that's the area. That's what area is. It's the number of squares. And in this case, they are inch squares. Um, explain your answer. There are 20, let's say there's 26. What does it mean? Uh, what other 26 of squares? There are 26 squares. We could say inch squares if we want. But really, it's just counting the number of squares, whatever those kinds of squares are. Explain why you combine the numbers as given. Uh, you know, why did I not add eight and two? Why did I not subtract two from eight? Why, you know, why did I do what I did? It's because there are um, two rows of eight squares, right? Two groups of eight. So that would be a perfectly good explanation. Two rows of eight squares. Try to write that a little more legibly this time. All right, this guy here. You're going to find the area of this irregular shape. Um, my favorite way to do this particular shape, uh, or really a lot of shapes, is just to break them up into a bunch of little rectangles. And rectangles are easy to find the area of. So the first thing I need to do is find out the length of this rectangle right here. Well, this from here to here, all the way across, is 14. This much is 8, and so this must much must be 6. 6 inches, so that makes this 18 inches square in area. This rectangle here is a 9 by 8, 9 inch by 8 inch, so that's 72 inches squared. 
Uh, that'd be great. You know, I could add 72 plus 18, except for the problem there is we're missing a big chunk out of this bigger rectangle. Right? How much of that chunk, uh, you know, what's in that chunk? There's It's a 7 by 2 rectangle, as indicated by these measurements. So that's 14 squares, square inches, that are not there. They're removed. They got, you know, helicoptered out of there. So subtract those out, and we'll be good. So 72 plus 18, let's see, what's 90? 90 minus 14 is 76. 76 inch squares. If you circle it, I'm fine with that. If you write it on this line, that's even better. Moving down. If ever you feel like I haven't uh, explained anything thoroughly enough, just go back and watch it again over and over. That's what's great about videos. Um, you need a common denominator here. 24, right? If I multiply this by 3 and this by 2, I'll be at 24 for both. So I just need to multiply the numerators by the same numbers as denominators, and I get 15 over 24 plus 14 over 24, and that gives me 29 over 24, which is perfectly good. Or 1 and 5 24 is also perfectly good. Both equally correct. That's 13 going on to 14. Uh, 28 times 14, just wanting to see that you know how to work this typical algorithm. Uh, 4 times 8 is 32, 2 1s, 3 10s. 4 times 20 is 80, plus 30 is 110, or 100 and, uh, let's see, 4 times 2, 80 is, yeah, 110. 1 times 8, or really 10 times 8, is 80. Uh, 10 times 20, 10 times 20 is 200. So adding it all up, we we'll wind up with 392. All right, uh, 14, I guess, next would be 15. So moving back up here. Multiplication of uh, fractions, we multiply straight across, cross-cancel if we can. Uh, 10 and 6 have a common factor of 2. Um, and that should do it. 5 times 4 is 20. 9 times 3 is 27. 20 over 27, that's the product. Uh, next, okay, we got to simplify this guy. All kind of quickly go through this, and if you want to hear it explained over and over, uh, then rewind. Uh, here we go. Y, we'll just do y to the 8th minus y to the 9th, and then I will stop there because we're doing, you know, as always, the order of operations. There's nothing I can do to the inside of the parentheses, so I need to raise the parentheses to this exponent because that's what comes next is exponents. So I'm going to raise something to the second power. That means multiply something by itself. That's it, multiply something by itself. So multiply something by itself. Okay, so that kind of taking care of the to the second power thing. Okay, what are those things? Is this a y to the 10th times y to the 10th is how that works out. But what is y to the 10th? y to the 10th means multiply something by itself, multiply y by itself 10 times, right? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and again here, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 10. So there's 10 y's times 10 more y's. That's a total of how many y's being multiplied together. There's 10, there's 10 more, 20 of them all together. Minus y to the 9th times y to the 10th. Okay. Well, what do we have here? We have y to the 9th times y to the 10th. It's kind of like what was going on here. We have 10 y's, sorry, 9 y's, multiplied by 10 more y's. That's a total of 19 y's. Uh, let's back it up. y to the 8th minus y to the 19th. And that's it. There's nothing else to do because... Uh, 
a Y to the 8th and a Y to the 19th are completely different things. They are as different from each other as apples and oranges, candles and Nerf darts. They are uncombinable and unsubtractable. We can't subtract one kind of thing from another kind of thing. It's like if I, if you have uh, eight apples and I take away from you 19 oranges, it's like, well, that hasn't affected the apples at all. There's still, you know, this many apples. There's still eight apples. And the 19 oranges, I don't even know if I have any oranges for you to take. Right? So the, we can't combine these and say that we have some new amount of something else. It's just as simple as it can be right there. So we're going to find, show, draw uh, the volume. It's the showing and the drawing that I'm going to do right now at this moment. Uh, I really kind of grown partial to this. This side, this drawing, is what I'm partial to. This side is three. One, two, three centimeters. This side is seven centimeters. Right there, right there, and that right there. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven centimeters. Great. Um, what does that mean to us? Well, it, it means that as far as volume goes, right? Volume is cubes, the number of cubes. What am I drawing here? Kind of extending that side out one unit so that what I have, say right here, is a thing that is one unit wide. That's the width of this wall that I just drew. It's one unit high, right? From there to there is one. And it is one unit I didn't know what I said. One unit high, one unit wide, how long, or whatever. It's one by one by one. It's called a cube, right? How many of those cubes are there? Well, I can fit three of them here. And I can fit another row of three right there. Another row of three, another row of three, another row of three, another row of three, another row of three. Seven rows of three, right? Again, two, three, four five, six, seven rows of one, two, three cubes. How many cubes is that? That's a wall of 21 cubes. 21 cubes. Uh, well, this nine centimeters tells me that I can fit another wall of cubes and another wall of cubes and a total of nine walls of cubes. Right, 21 cubes, right, and I can fit nine of those walls, and each wall has 21 cubes, right? So that is, uh, so 189. Of course, I'm going to double check that. Mental math is not my strength. So 189. That's how many cubes, and specifically the kind of cube I'm talking about is a centimeter cube. So 189 centimeter cubes. What's the question here? Please explain your answer in other words. Your answer is a number. Yes, it is. It's 189. It's counting something. Oh, is it? What is it counting? Well, it's counting the number of cubes. Centimeter cubes, to be exact. All right, uh, this morning, my oldest daughter, eight years old, saw me grading somebody's uh, quest and saw this thing here and said, what's that? So we went through the whole thing. We talked about simple areas of, of smaller rectangles with smaller uh, answers, right? Um, and we, we stepped it up and stepped it up and stepped it up. We, we got to about here when she got too hungry to really continue, so... Uh, she was doing pretty good. I was pretty proud of her. Um, but I explained to her the same I explained to you, that um, the area of a rectangle is a good way to show a product, to show multiplication. If I wanted to show you 6 times 4, I can just break out a rectangle. That's 6 on one side, 4 on the other side, and now we can see what multiplication is all about. It's about we have right uh, 6, like a row of 6. We actually have 4 rows of 6, 4 groups of 6. Or we could go the other way. Four squares like this can fit along this side, 
and we can fit six of those groups of four, six groups of four. So four groups of six, six groups of four. We get to see what multiplication is, like it represented physically. So if we back up, if I want to show you 24 times 74, I could make a rectangle that is 74 by 24, and its product is the area of the rectangle. But just saying that is not as easy as no, you know, is just as difficult as saying what is 24 times 74? I don't know off the top of my head. The easiness comes from breaking it up. 70 plus 4, 74. 20 plus 4 is 24. Right? And then we find the areas of all the little rectangles. And all those little rectangles, since we broke them up the way that we did, it's a little bit easier, quite a bit easier, I'd say, than just finding what is 24 times 74. And as we find these areas, it makes this algorithm, 74 times 24, the way you learned it from so long ago, it makes it make a lot more sense. Okay, Like, why do we do 4 times 4 as the first step? Well, if we're finding the areas of these rectangles, we see why. Because one of the rectangles is 4 by 4, which is 16. That's where our 16 comes from. Now, this algorithm is nice. It's efficient. It does some of this stuff uh, all at once rather than waiting to the end, but that's fine. Why do we do 4 times 70, essentially? 4 times 70 at the next step? Because you can see one of these rectangles is 4 on one side and 70 on the other. right? And a rectangle that is 70 by 4, that has 4 rows of 70 squares, right, is going to be 280 squares. right? And when I say 4 times 7, I use that mocking tone, because it's not 4 times 7, it's 4 times 70, right? But 4 times 7 is okay, it's 4 times 7 times 10. 4 times 7 is uh, 28. Add another uh, another 10 on top of that, you get 29. And I didn't misspeak there, I did add another 10, because these are 10s, this is 9 10s, right? Because this is the 1s place over here. Right, so, you know, if we were to add up 280 plus 16, that would be a total of... 296. That's what that part that we just did, that's what it's all about. It's finding the area of these two rectangles, adding them together, and finding that's 296 squares. Okay, so then after I do 4 times 4 and 4 times 7, I do 2 times 4. What's 2 times 4? That's really 20 times 4, and we see it represented here. 20 times 4 is 80, right? 2 times 4 we say is 8, but it's really 80. Right? That's what we're doing there. 20 times 4 is 80. And then the last step would be 2 times 7. 2 times 7. But it's really 20 times 70. And you can see that here. 20 by 70. 20 by 70. And a rectangle that is 20 by 70 is going to have how many squares fit in? It's going to have 1,400. Right? Because 2 times 7 is 14. And it's not only 2 times 7. It's it's like it's it's 2 times 7 times 10 times 10, because it's really 2 times 10 is 20, 7 times 10 is 70, 20 times 70. But 2 times 7 is 14, and 10 times 10 is 100, right? 1,400. And what happens here? 2 times 7, this isn't here, this is from the previous step. 2 times 7 is 14, right? Well, it has the 80 tack down there because they added these together in that algorithm. That's great. That's very efficient. And so if we added them together, we'd have 1,480. And so the next part is to add everything together, which we would have if we added these together. You'll have it if you had the add this stuff together. So we get 8, we get a 7 and an extra 100 there, 70 and an extra 100, uh, 400, 5, 6, 700, 700. Um, we're only, we're only up to 1,000, 1, 1,000. So 1,776, if I were to add all these four together, that'd be 1,776. Add these two together, that'd be 1,776. Okay, so that is a, is a great way to explain multiplication. I am proving it by teaching my eight-year-old this stuff way before she like would normally get it, or, or maybe not way before, she's eight, so maybe normally they'd see two-digit multiplication before that. I'm not an elementary teacher, so I don't know exactly when uh, students learn two-digit multiplication by two-digit um, or two-digit numbers tied to two-digit numbers. But she's almost up to speed 
after one morning of talking about it. I let her stop when she gets tired, hungry and stuff, but she's ready. She's primed for this information. Um, and, and I know it's because she gets support from me and I'm a math teacher and stuff, but, um, it certainly has been more substantial for her than just learning the algorithm. Right. And, uh, hopefully someday she'll teach her kids this rectangle here. I think it's great. So solve the following equation, check for extraneous solutions. Uh, simple enough. Suffice it to say that when we work, work with absolute values, for reasons that I will explain in the in the future here on this this uh, quest, we are just gonna f we're gonna set the insides of the absolute value equal to the other side, uh, and we're gonna set it equal to the opposite of the other side. Here, let me let me go to another problem. Explain why we're doing that. Or I won't. Did I miss one? Going up. Does not look like I did. Hmm. Uh, we should have had a, a, a simpler one than this. Um, but um, let me make up an example. So the absolute value of x plus 1 was equal to 5. Well, if the guts of the absolute value came out to be 5, if I took a number and put it in for x and added 1 and got 5, then the absolute value would be 5. That's great. But this is also true. If x plus 1, if I plugged in something for x and got negative 5, right, then we would also be in good shape because negative 5 would be what's inside the absolute value and the absolute value of negative 5 is 5. So we solve these both and get if x is 4, 4 plus 1 is 5, absolute value of 5 is 5. Subtract 1, if x is negative 6, negative 6 plus 1 is negative 5, absolute value of negative 5 is 5. So that's why we, every time we solve an absolute value equation, we set it equal to the other side and we also take it and set it equal to the opposite of the other side. Negative 9x plus 12, the opposite of that. Just like this. Solving for x, I'm going to add 9x to both sides. I get a positive x plus 5 equals 12. x equals, subtract 5 from both sides, I get 7 x is 7. Maybe that works and maybe it doesn't. So we got to test it here in a minute. Um, first, I'm going to distribute this negative. Negative 8x plus 5 equals 9x minus 12. I'm going to add 8x to both sides. 5 equals 17x minus 12. I'm going to add 12 to both sides. I get 17 equals 17x. x equals one. Maybe both of those work. Maybe only one of them works. The problem that we get, the only problem that we're going to have, this is to save you work. The only problem we're going to have is if we wind up having a negative number on the right side, because absolute values can't be equal to negative numbers. It doesn't make any sense. Absolute values are always positive numbers. So if one of these causes us to get a negative number, then we have a problem. So we try out negative seven. Negative nine times seven, that's a big number big negative number, right? So if I subtract that from 12, will I have a negative number? I think you can see I will. Negative 63 plus 12. I don't even have to continue, but I will. Uh, this will be negative 51. Uh, negative 51. That is negative. An absolute value being equal to negative 51 is nonsense. So that does not work. Let's make sure this one works. I can see it's going to, but I will prove it. Negative 9 plus 12 is positive 3, right? That just means absolute value equals positive 3. Perfectly fine. So this one works. This one's great. So x equals 1 
is the only valid solution. The other solution is extraneous. It's extra, right? It does not fit inside the set of solutions. Uh, thank you for watching. Uh, any, you know, use use any and all of these to prepare for our redo. Uh, if you want to do a retake, uh, then you are welcome to do so. Come by anytime, and we'll take care of it. Thanks for watching.